Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here. I want to do a video today about the exciting prospect if you are looking at upgrading your home internet connectivity from something like a DSL based connection to something like fiber optic. Now this is exactly the situation that I find myself in in Daniel Rosal YouTube HQ. Currently the internet connection I have here is a VDSL2 based connection. Now that's the connectivity that the Bezek internet company where I'm based here in Israel uses. It's actually quite old. Now VDSL2 is a variant of DSL. You've also got a ADSL, VDSL and VDSL2 and that's a slowish form of internet. DSL is basically using old phone connectivity to carry internet into houses over the last mile and that's important to understand that when you look at these sort of unusual connectivities like coaxial um, or DSL, you're basically talking about stuff that's really at the tail end of the internet. You know, it's traveling through the oceans in these big sub oceanic um, containers that are full of fiber optic cores and it's going at a very quick rate through uh, the land-based infrastructure. But just at that last point where it branches out to homes and businesses, but particularly homes, um, you're, you're, you're getting into DSL wiring and that's gonna really um, limit your internet speed. The theoretical limit of VDSL2, to the best of my knowledge, is 200 megabits per second Mbps. That means you're never going to get a 400 megabit per second internet connection so long as your internet is based on uh, VDSL2, for instance. Now, what's happening at the moment where I'm based is that the uh, companies are putting down fiber optic. Now, I've done as much research as I can. There's three different providers laying fiber infrastructure in Israel, to the best of my knowledge. I'm on every single list, but there's no real way to know unless I've missed it. I've tried everything. There's no real way to know exactly when fiber is going to arrive at your doorstep. When you're going to wake up one morning to see a uh, construction crew putting down fiber optic cable on the ground and you say, wow, it's here. So what I'm doing instead is, as any self-respecting home networking geek does, not just looking at the network I have now, I'm trying to make sure that I have everything in place so that when fiber optic connectivity comes, I'm going to be not found with my networking pants down. Now, um, when we're talking about fiber optic, the first thing is it's probably gonna be coming in as SFP. You can actually see in the background on this side of me, it's reversed. That little wire, they did really ugly wiring, the technician, that's the DSL coming in. So where that is, there's going to be a SFP laser point and probably an ISP router. And I've already spec'd out um, the SFP to RJ45 adapter that I'm going to be getting to put that into load balancer. Anyway, what, what I want to talk about today is um, show you guys just all the various bottlenecks you could encounter just in case you're also uh, you know, networking your home or planning your networking and you haven't really thought about what could slow down your connectivity. So let me just open up this uh, diagram I've been working on here and I've called it fiber upgrade bottleneck avoidance. Um, so here, here's my current route to internet and I'm just doing this to show um, the various uh, parts of your network that can be a problem. So right, this is what I have currently. I have my ISP router. Um, that's a cellular router. Uh, this is the high availability failover system I've been doing a few videos on. Uh, really, really nice system. And I'm now sort of mildly obsessed with load balancing routers. They're amazing, amazing pieces of tech. So these two guys are coming into the load balancer. The load balancer is doing the failover stuff. Uh, it's saying, if you're down, bring you up etc and from the load balancer into the eth into an ethernet switch and from an ethernet switch into my computer now this is just the networking in my room here um, there's networking in the rest of the house as well so even here there's actually more points of uh, bottleneck than you might think so for instance what we have here the first bottleneck is the load balancer and I'm going to just show in a second two potential bottlenecks if you're using something like a load balancer, if you're using a switch, um, or if you're just using a router. These, there are two potential bottlenecks you'll want to be aware of and look into uh, upgrading. 
So I've already picked out my next load balancer. I thought I was gonna be going for a Mickey, M M Miko trick. Unfortunately, um, I didn't deal with the best company here. Whatever, it's a, it's, 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 it's a sore story. I'm getting another TP-Link uh, gadget basically. Um, but that's gonna have faster ports. And then don't forget about the, the cabling itself. So every single cable on your network, and that goes from whatever's bringing the, so this is gonna be a fiber optic. Um, it's gonna be the wall point, then there's gonna be the transmitter. Up to now we're good, but then there's gonna be a cable going from that into load balancer. Every single patch cable, every single ethernet cable, even a 10 centimeter ethernet cable you could have in your server cabinet is a potential bottleneck if it doesn't support speeds up to what you're expecting to get with your fiber connectivity. So that's number one. All the hardware components are bottlenecks, so our potential bottlenecks. So this guy, I went for a very, very basic load balancer because this was kind of experimentary to see if I could figure out the networking. It's the TP-Link R470T Plus and the ports there are 10 and 100 ports. So that's a bottleneck. Finally, the switch is a bottleneck. Ethernet switches come in various grades. You have 10, 100 Ethernet switches and you have gigabit capable Ethernet, Ethernet switches. And I'm sure you probably have 10 gigabit and 100 gigabit Ethernet switches. Now, the connectivity that I'm hearing from people is like 300 megabits per second. So gigabit is what I have in my mind as that'll be enough. So I'm not looking for beyond that. And finally, if you're using internet and getting it into your desktop, then your network interface card, your NIC, is potentially but unlikely to be a bottleneck. Now, the reason it's very unlikely is because from what I understand, what, it, what I've been told by more knowledgeable PC people, the vast majority of ethernet cards on the market today, even if the Wi-Fi throughput is something like 300 megabits per second, it's very likely that the maximum speed on the actual RJ45 ethernet ports going to be a thousand, going to be a gigabit port. So those spec out your network, I would recommend diagramming it. I'm using this diagram uh, draw.io. I really, really love this, uh, this, uh, this little program here. And uh, just plot out your network. Now I could go further. I could say, right, in addition to coming off the load balancer, there is also a, um, there's also a Wi-Fi access point and there is a cable going between the load balancer and that Wi-Fi access point. So we have two more things to check out here. So you can easily make a list from this and go component by component and investigate every switch on your network, investigate every single cable, look up the cabling and see is it Cat5e or Cat5 or, or worse, have you got Cat4 on your network? It's possible. And then look at the Wi-Fi. So the Wi-Fi here is going to be a 300 megabit per second bottleneck for me. Uh, I don't really care about that because I don't use Wi-Fi and 300 is good enough for Netflix and all that kind of stuff. So, but anyway, just make a, construct a good diagram of your network and uh, write down, uh, that's, this is my recommendation, write down every, every single component that fails to meet the throughput. Now, um, another good thing to do is when you're, when you're looking at components, so there's two things I'd be looking at. Now, this is what I've ended up going for as my next load balancer. Now, it's actually described as a VPN router, but you can use this as a load balancer. And the reason I've gone for this is because it's a compact little thing, five switches. Uh, I was looking at Ubiquities and uh, I was looking at uh, what, what's called Miko Trick as well. Anyway, I'm sure this will be just fine, if not superlatively wonderful. Um, but it's you know it's one of TP-Link smaller little uh, boxes, and you know the networking I'm doing here is not sophisticated, and all I need is basically two WAN ports to to, to do my load balancing, my failover between the two. Anyway, um, the data sheets are basically the places you want to go, and TP-Link and most companies do good jobs of making these pretty accessible, and uh, get past all the marketing stuff. Uh, usually it's at the tail end, that's kind of the industry convention is you'll have a few nice pages of look at all the wonderful things this product can do and uh, finally you'll get to the cold hard tech facts here, specifications. Now TP-Link also have specs listed here. Uh, I think it's a lot nicer in this uh, format. Now what you're looking for number one in any piece of hardware, whether it's a router, whether it's a switch, 
whether it's a load balancing VPN router, SMB router, wired router, whatever the, the category name may be, first thing to do is check out the port. So you can see this thing has one fixed WAN port, it's got three interchangeable LAN slash WAN ports, and it's got one LAN port. And somewhere here, it should give us the speed of the port. It does, sorry, it's right in front of me, one gigabit. So in Ethernet ports, you have basically three types of ports. You have 10, theoretically, you're, you're not gonna find any hardware on the market that is 10 ports, but you, what you will see is 10 100, which means that the ports are capable of uh, supporting basically up to 100 megabits per second. That means technically there are 10 ports and they're also 100 ports. They can do up to 10 and they can also do up to 100, but networking nowadays, nothing is, in, nothing is so slow that 10 wouldn't be a bottleneck so realistically it's 10 100 and 100 is what matters and then you have these gigabit ports um sometimes you see it written like this i've seen this in a couple of spec sheets gbe which stands for gigab gigabit ethernet um but basically those are your kind of two main ports now you, as i said you can get faster but for people looking at home networking um, in this kind of a territory, you're probably most interested to see that it's one capable. Um, Cat7 Ethernet, for instance, I believe, is now capable of 10 gigabit throughput. So really what you're looking for depends upon how fast your connectivity is going to be and really how long you need out of this hardware. So my thinking is that, you know, for this is like a two year upgrade. So if I get two years out of this load balancer and two years out of these Ethernet cables, uh, while we're still renting, um, that's perfectly fine. And then if you know, if, if we, if if my wife and I buy a property, then we'll probably look at well, what's going to be 15 years future proof. But I have a strong feeling we're not going to be getting more than given given that it took until 2021 or probably 2022 to just get out of DSL. It's probably going to be a while before we're looking at Ethernet that's in the. Uh, above the one gigabyte uh, uh, speed bracket. So that's number one in the uh, spec sheet is check the ports, what type of speed they support. Now the second thing is actually what's called the NAT throughput. Now the network address translation or NAT is sort of a topic for another day, but basically translating on the fly between your local IPs and the public IP that's assigned to every device coming off your router. So that has a throughput as well. And typically, as you can see, that throughput's a little bit less than the um, actual speed of any one port. So that's sort of important, but the difference is not very huge. You can see here, the static IP NAT throughput is listed as uh, 930 on the, on the upload speed and 940 on the download. And you've also got uh, NAT throughputs listed for different protocols here as well. And you can take a look at those now. Um, basically, there sometimes is uh, sort of controversy between what people uh, get when they test their own NAT throughput using testing tools and what the manufacturer, in this case TP-Link, says their NAT throughput is. And TP-Link did a uh, sort of answer on this here and they basically pinned the blame on the uh, testing tool that people are using. They say, you know, some customers give us feedback that their tested throughputs are different from our NAT throughput. There are many throughput measuring tools such as iPerf, Charlotte, SmartBits. We use SmartBits and it's pretty expensive and it's industry grade. So this to me is not a, not a whole area of, that's very interesting because looking at those NAT throughputs, 500 megabits per second would be just about the most I would ever be expecting to put through the forthcoming load balancing router but it, you know by all means do more digging into this area but it, it, it is definitely worth checking on the spec sheet but uh you know if you don't see a dramatic difference i personally wouldn't worry about it but you will see some difference typically between what the what any one port is capable of and what the machine is capable of as a networking device between the wan and the lan and that's basically what we're talking about when we're talking we're talking about the aggregate connectivity on the LAN site, moving through the load balancer and going out to the WAN interfaces. How, uh, what's the maximum throughput that is that it is capable, it is capable of as a hardware device. 
Um, and that is basically, that's it for the most part. It, oh yeah, I wanted to show this one as well. This is just a quick reference from How To Geek. And uh, they're showing you here, um, I need to just zoom out a bit to get myself out of the, out of the picture. So you can see Cat5, these are the various categories of Ethernet cabling. Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6, and Cat6a. Now, what's significant is if you see here, between Cat5 and Cat5e, that's where I would say for people getting your Firebird connectivity, if you see Cat5 there, it's got a maximum, it's a 10100 capable uh, rating for ethernet cabling. That means it can go up to 100 megabits per second. That's not that fast. That means if you have 300 megabits per second fiber and your entire house is laid with category five ethernet, you're not gonna get anything better than 100 in either direction through your computers. That's a problem. That basically means you're wasting two thirds of your connectivity. When, once you get up to Cat5e, now I've checked all my ethernet cables in the last couple of days as part of this planning process. I do have quite a bit of Cat5e cabling, but I'm not worried really because of the fact that that's rated up to one gigabyte, uh, one gigabit per second, and I don't foresee that being a problem for quite a number of years. But again, if you're, if you're building a home now, let's say, and you're putting down ethernet cabling, and you want this, you know, you don't want to have to run ethernet through the uh, interior walls and you don't have to do this process so often. So go for cat six or above because you'll be getting 10 gigabit per second speed or better. I'm not even sure what cat seven does. It's not even listed on this chart. Uh, they all do power over ethernet now. So cat five is something you'd probably want to avoid if you're networking for, uh, is something you'd want to avoid if you're networking for a uh, fiber capable home. Um, if you're future proofing, you'd probably want to go for cat six or above. I was just looking out of interest what cat four can do, cat four and below because I, ne I never see them on these comparison charts. I think it's something like 10 megabits per second. So effectively for today's networking, cat four is unusable. Cat five is where it starts to get into gigabit capable transfer speeds. You're looking at cat five E or above, not cat five, cat five E. And if you want to get 10 and above, you're looking for cat six. So basically to summarize this, if you are going from a slow internet connectivity setup like DSL and you're getting fiber next week, great news, right? Well, just before the fiber guy comes, do a bit of research on your home network, map out every network interface card, look up every NIC on every ethernet device on your network and check, double check, what the maximum speed from the RJ45 is. Check every single cable, inspect every single cable. It's typically written on the sheath if this is 5E or 5 or 6 or 7. Check every single ethernet cable, check every single switch. Just Google the name and you'll be able to find the spec sheet on the internet in about two seconds. And, um, and that's basically it. And then once you know that there's no bottlenecks, you'll be able to enjoy the full speed that, that, uh, that your upgraded connectivity can provide. Thank you guys very much for watching this YouTube video. This is me, Daniel Rosell. Uh, if you wanna get more videos about tech, Linux and networking and other such topics, feel free to subscribe.